Hey guys, welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. I am 50% of that podcast. And I'm the other 50%. <laughs> Tim Chelsvik, Matt Drury, and uh, welcome back to another episode. We're in that time of year, you know, we do this all, all year round, this podcast. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, this is the time of year that people are most interested in it because it's, it's on everybody's brain right now. Absolutely. How do I kill a deer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and people are killing deer. We're seeing in the DeerCast app, we're seeing so many great success stories. It's so awesome that folks are sharing those, and people are killing some thumpers, too. So, and, and it's cool because with, with that, we're seeing a lot of people are uploading their content. We're mm -hmm. seeing their first deer ever, their best deer ever, their, whatever yeah. the case may be, seeing uh, a, a, a guy bring his wife out or, mm -hmm. or a, a child for their first hunt or whatever. It's been really cool to see kind of the prog progression of the whitetail season from across the country with these deer cast yes. users. You know, the weirdest thing so far I've seen in our deer cast user submissions there have been two pictures, and I hope this doesn't become a thing, but people are laying down next to their deer. Hmm. There's, they're that seems like a, like some something that came out of Instagram and <laughs> that, yeah, that we it, don't want to promote. It came from somewhere, but it's like, what in the world? It's like, when, like in the old days when people used to take photos at funerals. Yeah. It's, I, don't, Weird. I don't get it. So <laughs> we're going to encourage people not to do that. Yeah. It's yeah. probably not going to show up in the feed if you're. And, and as soon as we get off this podcast, you got to show it to me. I want to see it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Darkly fascinating. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, one of the really cool things that I've appreciated about deer hunting is the fact that it's multi disciplinary like you not only if you're a bow hunter not only are you an archer but you pay attention to biology and geology and nutrition and all those kind of things there's there's a lot going on yeah and you got to break it down i think a little bit uh at more granular so how to, food plots how does the hunting terrain affect the whitetail movement structure uh, uh bedding area those types of mm -hmm. things they play a huge part and i think maybe more than anything is weather Totally, right? Totally. And that kind of parlays us into today's topic and our guest for today. It's almost like you knew that we were heading that direction. <laughs> Somehow I had a, a <laughs> funny feeling. <laughs> we're excited to have Dave Dombeck. Dave is the expert senior meteorologist for AccuWeather, and he's joining us live via Skype right now. Dave, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I'm excited about this. It's a new uh, new venture for me here today i can say this we probably won't have ever have had a smarter human being on this podcast probably true <laughs> That's, he's <laughs> legit <laughs> <laughs> well and, and one of the, the cool things so in in kind of the lead up to this particular show we're talking with the folks at accuweather to coordinate all this and one of the things we mentioned was we'd like to have someone to talk to that has a frame of reference for deer hunting because it's such a niche world and there's just a level of credibility that someone has so so dave why don't you let the listeners know kind of what your experience is as a as a hunter and meteorologist okay well i guess i'll start with the with the meteorologist first um i'm one of those what we would call up in here in pennsylvania in the northeast um a weather weenie i love <laughs> the weather i've been interested in the weather since i was just a little kid probably kindergarten, first grade or so, mm -hmm. you asked my mom, I, I always knew what I wanted to be since I was in elementary school. I always wow. wanted to, you know, study the weather. Yeah. That's, that's what I've always wanted to do. Always interested, always wondering why it's thunderstorming, you know, five miles down the road and not at our place. I have a log and I could go up in my attic to these, I don't know where it is, but it's in some box somewhere, but I could show you uh, a record of the snowfall where I grew up in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Jeez. Uh, every year when it would snow, get my ruler, measure it, mark it down, tally it up for the season. I did that all through uh, elementary school and high school. I got into college and went to uh, Penn State, got my mm -hmm. degree in meteorology from Penn State. And it's one of those, like the only place I wanted to go is Penn State or Penn State. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm Pennsylvania born and raised. I, I lived my whole life in the state. I grew up in the northeast part of the state, a town of uh, Dallas. It's up okay. uh, by Wilkesbury, Scranton, up in that part of the state. And then I went to Penn State, got my uh, degree in meteorology in 1980. Uh, but pretty much, I, that's where I wanted to go. I wanted they have they have an excellent program. They still do to this day. Um, and it's funny because when I was going to, uh, when I went to Penn State, I had my next youngest brother try to keep the snowfall record up for me and <laughs> keep the tradition alive <laughs> he, did, he did an okay job for a while 
and then he got real sloppy, he missed a couple of storms, and I was so mad at him. I wanted to just deck him, and it's like, okay, just chill out. You got to just – he doesn't have the passion for the weather like I do. He wasn't so I, a weather weenie. No. <laughs> I have to just let that go. So so here I am today. I started in 1980, and I've been here ever since, 38-plus uh, years. That's almost unheard of today, uh, staying that long with a, with a company. So I like what I do. Um, I, I forecast mostly in the northeast, although mm-hmm. I look at the weather all over the world. But the northeastern part of the country is my specialty, and – Right now, I do some radio, a little bit, uh, not as much as I used two years ago. Uh, the thing that I do mostly is uh, talk to, I'm kind of the behind-the-scenes guy with some of our big uh, TV clients um, in Philadelphia, New York City, and so forth. So that's the weather background. That's the meteorology part. Um, as for hunting, uh, I grew up in a, in, a, in, a, in a family. My dad, my uncles, uh, deer hunting was big. You know, deer hunting is a, is a big thing in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, to this day, um, the away from the cities, away from Philly and, and, and Pittsburgh proper, the it, we've always started, the rifle season always starts the Monday after Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Always been that way forever. And all the schools are off that day. <laughs> the holiday. State holiday. And, That'll tell you something. Yep. In fact, our um, our garbage, the, the guys who, who collect our garbage, um, if, if a holiday like the 4th of July or whatever are, are – our day is Monday. If it's the 4th of July or whatever, they'll collect the garbage. But deer season, we always have to get our garbage out early. They get it on Saturday. They're off that <laughs> the day. The rules are completely different. I, like I love that. it. Yeah. yeah, that's the way it ought to be. So, so, I mean, so deer hunting has been big. I've, I've done small game hunting. I mean, gee, I remember as a kid, my brother and I going, you know, squirrel hunting and mm-hmm. rabbit uh, small game. I do a little bit of bird hunting, grouse and, and pheasant um, some. I'd like, like I was telling you, Tim, uh, we emailed each other. I'd love to do more hunting. It's just life gets in the I, way, you know, yeah, your totally job, family commitments, things. I'd love to do more hunting and that's the round to it. I got to get round to it to having more hunting time, but deer hunting is big. Um, I don't uh, archery hunt, although a good buddy of mine does several good friends of mine do. And I'd like to get into that, uh, pretty much rifle season. I look forward to that. And I always try sure. to take some time during that two week rifle season, uh, to get out and try to fill a tag or two. So we've established it. He has the credentials. <laughs> he does, yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, how do you impress a girl in high school by letting her know that you have a weather log? <laughs> <laughs> well, how many people do? You know, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. <laughs> he's got it. This guy is passionate about he life. He stands out in a crowd. No kidding. <laughs> nice job. I, I tell you what, Dave, you and my dad would get along. Oh, totally. He, you could talk to, I guarantee These you, guys he'd pick your brain. Meet. Yeah, he'd call, he calls himself the lunatic. <laughs> so he, he's, he's, you'd get along really well. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, when, when, when meteorologists, when, when a bunch of us get together, I mean, people look at us, even, you know, family members, friends, they look at us like we're like freaks or something, you know, <laughs> like, well, what are you guys, what are you guys doing? You know, what are you talking about? It's like, you don't get it. You don't understand yeah. if you're not a, a weather weenie, you don't have, you don't, don't have the passion. You just don't understand it. Well, I love it because I think this really you know, this really uh, lends itself well to, well, we have a great question of the day. And we put a few things out there on social media to make sure we had some good quality questions for you when you jumped on. But we really surprisingly got some really detailed questions that I think you're going to have a lot of insight for us mm-hmm. on. I don't know if we want to jump into any of that or what do you think, Tim? Yeah, yeah. So so let's let's do that. This uh, This question of the day comes from our listener, Scott. And the question of the day is brought to you by the Lacrosse Alpha Burley Pro. Tread lightly, hunt confidently. Hi, my name is Scott Davis from Gainesville, Virginia. Dave, could you explain uh, what factors in the, in the weather patterns affect the thermals the most and how best to hunt them? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, one of the reasons I, I really like that question is because I don't think – I don't think everyone knows enough about thermals or even that thermals are a thing. Well, and it's hard. It's like the basic simple principle of it. Once you kind of hear that explanation, like dad and Mark talk about it, it's easy in principle to start to understand. I think, you know, Mm -hmm. Hey, when in the morning when the sun comes up, kind of the, the, the heat of the earth kind of has your thermals rising as the sun goes down, they kind of start falling, falling, but like to get it on, 
a level of what Dave understands it and knows it by. I'll be curious because that's really the only understanding I have sure. of it. Mark and Terry, there's a little more intimate, but I, I'm looking forward to what Dave has to say here. Yeah, so so Dave, maybe you could start out by, by giving your explanation of thermals and then digging into Scott's question. Well, and actually what, what Tim had said, that's a, that's a perfect, a very a good uh, launching pad um, to start from as far as what a thermal is. I mean, think of the name, thermal. It means heat. It means it has something to do with heat. And the basic principle on any given day, how do you know? You look at your thermometer. How does the temperature rise? Uh, the the sun does not heat the air. The sun heats the ground or some surface at the ground near the ground, and then that in turn uh, heats the air. So it kind of heats from from the from the ground up basically. Mm -hmm. And as you heat the air, it it's lighter, and so it rises. Um, and so that's how on any given day, especially when there's, there's little or no wind, the thermal, um, you know, the, 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 the air coming up uh, a mountain ridge in the mornings or in the evening when the sun sets and it cool, starts to cool, then the air gets uh, more dense and it starts to flow down the mountain or the ridge, the other direction. Um, that principle works every day if there's either light winds or no winds. Uh, the thermal situation, when you have, let's say you have a, a situation where there's there's a strong, whatever direction the wind is, but you've got, uh, you know, a 10 knot or 10 mile per hour, 15, 20 mile per hour wind, that thermal situation is pretty much irrelevant um, because the it's the dominant flow at the time that's that's taking over sure. thermal, you know, it's still it tries to work, but it. You know, it's 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 the it's the gradient winds, the the prevailing winds at the time that really uh, take precedence. So, you know, as far as that thermal, you're right. <clears throat> if if I had the choice, um, and it's a calm day or nearly calm day, where do you want to be? Where do you want to set your stand up? Uh, would be at the top of a ridge in the morning because the air is flowing uphill, and and deer trying to come up, they're not going to get scent of that uh, of you. Uh, you know, the opposite in, in the, in the evenings, uh, late afternoon and evenings. Um, but again, there's local effects. There's the, the shape of the terrain. There's how high you are. Sometimes there's a case where, uh, what we call the mixing layer, how, how, how deep, um, the, the air mixes through with, is it only a thousand feet you're mixing through, or is it a 5,000 foot layer near the ground that you mix through? So, uh, a lot of that is 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 very important. What what's your elevation? If you're hunting out west, I mean, a lot of elevations, even in the valleys. Like um, my daughter went to uh, University of Utah, Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. right in the city down in Salt Lake. It's like 4,200 feet. There's nowhere near that elevation here in Pennsylvania. Um, so you know you got to know your elevation, and that's another another key factor there. So a couple questions for you that I have when it, as it pertains to thermals that I've always wondered and just wasn't brave enough to ask Mark or Terry. <laughs> <Yo>. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. We got an actual expert. So how do, how does the barometric pressure play into it? Because we always talk about, you know, with, with deer, you know, you start getting above that 29.95 and rising uh, barometric pressure and it, it helps deer get up on their feet and start moving. So if you had a really high pressure afternoon hunt where the pressure is rising, would that, discount and there's little to no wind and so your thermals are dropping would the pressure still kind of bring your scent up or not i guess it would really depend on what the temperature is because even in a rising in a rising pressure let's say behind a cold front and a, and a high big high pressure system is building in uh, you could still have a situation where the temperatures are uh, are rising some and so you, you would still get that thermal effect. But generally speaking, rising pressures, um, especially as you get now into later fall and into the winter months, it's going to be associated with the colder or chillier air. And so that's mm -hmm. going to mean sinking air generally. Yeah. Okay. So early season for us, one of the tactics that we always talk about is paying attention to your thermals. And the biggest reason you were touching on it there is that in the afternoons and right there before, you know, the, the last 15 minutes, you know, the, the magical 15 minutes, the, the, a lot of times it seems like the wind dies down to nothing yep. in the early season. And so your thermals really do become a vital uh, impact on your hunt themselves. If you're hunting up on a ridge 
in, in, in the afternoon and all of a sudden the temperatures start dropping, you could bet your thermal thermals it's are falling. likely going to go with it and yeah. go probably down to the bedding area where they're, they're, they're coming out of. Yeah, and that, that kind of goes along with the idea that early in the season, September, even into October, you could still have these, these big Bermuda highs in control and not much wind in the atmosphere through the whole column. And so it does tend to be a, you know, a calmer period with winds. Uh, but you get later in the season, the jet stream is strengthening and, and, and coming southward. You get the faster moving uh, systems, fronts and, and, and low pressure systems and so forth. And so you just get a lot more movement of the air just with weather systems going through the later into the season you go. Mm -hmm. Now, I've always, I've always in my mind conceptualized thermals as a passive influencer on your scent profile and the wind as being a more aggressive influencer in terms of the direction that's pushing. I think you mentioned that when you're talking about like if you got a 10 mile an hour wind, that's probably going to counteract the effects of thermals. But where is that line of, you know, is it a two mile an hour wind or, you know, what is that line where thermals can become a stronger influencer and kind of over kind of supersede what the wind's doing? I would have to say, uh, and I, this is just a guess on my part, but it would definitely be less than 10 mile per hour winds okay. uh, in, on average. And it might even be less than six or seven miles per hour. Okay. One of the, one of the questions that we got from our, um, our social media crew was, uh, was really around, how wind is forecasted because, and this has happened to me multiple times. I kind of gotten to the point now where I wait till I get to my hunting property to figure out what direction the wind's coming out of. Cause out of all the variables in my forecast, it seems like wind tends to be the most squirrely. Now what's your, how, how is wind forecasted and how accurate is it typically? Here's a, a quick and dirty way uh, that I would, as a meteorologist, um, if I knew nothing else and I just looked at a, at a surface weather map or a projected surface weather map, and the tighter the gradient in pressure is, um, the more is going to blow between a high pressure and low pressure that's, that's called you know the isobars or the lines of equal pressure. When they're really tightly packed together on a weather map, that means the pressure gradient is pretty tight okay. and winds are going to blow stronger the tighter the pressure gradient is so that that would be a quick and dirty way of doing that not knowing the actual speeds but knowing whether there's a lot of wind or some wind or or very little wind now as for speeds uh let's just take an example on a day where say maybe it's a fair weather day uh the sun's out or it's partly sunny mix of clouds and sun whatever mm -hmm. but it's a fairly well mixed atmosphere that day. There's a somewhat of a breeze blowing, and we look at what's called, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard this term, skew T log P or soundings. Oh, every day I talk about that. <laughs> we I, just, I don't. Sorry, we were just talking about it. <laughs> Basically, what it is, it's it's a it's a vertical slice of the atmosphere. Oh. Um, and and you get the actual soundings where they launch the weather balloon at various sites throughout the country, throughout mm -hmm. the world. Um, and what it does is it measures the temperature, it measures the humidity, the winds at different levels. But then we also have model data from the various computer models that any site on that map, any site in the U.S. or North America, for example, mm -hmm. you click on that point and it'll plot up a, a vertical profile of the atmosphere at that point. And as we all know, it's, it's pretty common knowledge, the higher up in the atmosphere you go away from the ground, the stronger the winds are. That's yeah. that's pretty common. If, you, any, if you've ever been up in a plane or a glider or whatever, you know that principle or just top of the mountain versus uh, in a valley. Now, on that day, that example where I have a fair weather day, it's a well-mixed day, breezy, dry, and I look at that sounding, a model sounding, for two in the afternoon, and I see that the mixing layer, the, the, the depth to which the air is going to mix. And by mixing, I mean up and down, up and down those thermals, rising here, sinking here, rising here, sinking here. If I see that is, let's say, up to 5,000 feet or 850 millibars uh, in meteorological terms, then I know that that's about the level where you could bring winds down uh, from that level down to the surface. So now I check 
the other charts. I check some other data and I say, okay, at this location, at two in the afternoon, the winds up at 5,000 feet are blowing at about 30, 35 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. So that would tell me that, yeah, maybe the average winds that day are 12 to 20 or 25 or so, but there can be a gust to maybe 35 miles per hour. That's kind of the top end. Where'd that wind come from? It came down from above. That's called downward transfer of momentum. You're bringing that air from up above with that mixing as you mix the air, sinking air, and you brought that air right down. Some some days that mixing layer is only 2,000 feet th thick or 3,000 or 2,500. And so you determine how far up you're mixing and then look at those winds at that level. And that kind of gives you an upper end, um, a ceiling, so to speak, of how strong the winds could be that day. And that's why some days you ever, you guys have ever been in a picnic or whatever, and everything is calm, and you got the napkins and the plates on, and it's a nice day. And all of a sudden, out of the like nowhere, here comes this wind that blows everything off the table. It's like, where did that come mm -hmm. from? Well, it came came from above. There was a gust that you pulled that air down from above, and that's what happened. So, and speaking of the technology side of it and these models, how far out can you guys? you know, kind of uh, figure out what the forecast is going to be, the future forecast is going to be. And then how does that degrade the accuracy degrade? Like what's the kind of time frame there? Like, is it, you know, one to three days out the best, you know, really the most accurate. And then, you know, four to 10 is four to 15 now is really kind of, eh, it could be this, but we really don't know. Like how do you guys take those models and really work to get an accurate forecast? Well, I could tell you personally, in my days, in, in the, the you know the days from when I was going to school at Penn State to my early days of forecasting here at AccuWeather to now, I mean the technology has just like exploded. Mm. Um, it used to be that we had basically like two models back when I was going to school in my first couple of years uh, uh, as a as a professional meteorologist. Now we have dozens of models. It's almost like we're modeled to death and information <laughs> to death today. Um, but I can say that, you know, pretty much I could tell you guys could go out right now uh, and you can make an absolutely 100 percent accurate forecast in like, you know, for a minute from now. Go outside and make that forecast and now cast and you could be very, very accurate. Um, generally speaking, it's a curve. You know, the farther out into the future you go, the the accuracy is going to drop off. That's mm -hmm. a that's a pretty understandable uh, sure. principle there. Uh, it used to be 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, if you said, oh, I'm going to make a forecast out to, you know, seven days out or 10 days out, it's like, oh, that's that's uh, voodoo meteorology. You know, yeah. that's <laughs> Black <do magic>. that. <laughs> that's just uh, science fiction. But um, the way the models have improved um, and the technology today, I would say you get you're not now you're not going to get detail. You're, I'm, I can't tell you that, you know, next uh, Tuesday there's going to be a thunderstorm at, you know, uh, 225 in the afternoon. You, mm -hmm. you, there's no way you'll ever get that kind of detail. But you could see trends out certainly you know week 10 days um on okay there's there's likely to be some kind of a system coming through then uh maybe you're going to be off by half a day or a day on that but you know that there's there's a system coming through with some rain then you know that there's a very good chance given the teleconnections and the patterns around the world that in 10 days to two weeks from now it's going to be getting cold in the northeast or, or warmer or whatever so those general things you could tell and now we have we have so, some of the guys I work with uh, there's a there's a whole team here that they forecast long range they're going seasonally they're going you know they're forecasting for like next spring already at least some general ideas for different parts of the country wow. so um, again they're very general. But you, you could give I would I would say you have a fair amount of detail out through three, four days and at least some de detail, at least the general ideas pretty in a, in a pretty good sense out out to about a week or 10 days. So in, in, in your mind, do you have a sense where technology needs to go in order to push that envelope a little farther? Like, do we need more processing power? Do we need better satellites or what's the what's the next step in pushing the forecast out? Yeah, I would say exactly what you said was is certainly, you know, the technology, new, you know, information into the models. The more the better the information in the models, the better they're going to be. Um, uh, satellite, radar, all that information you feed in. However, you're never going to you're never going to lose the human touch. Um, hmm. and that's where forecasters our role uh, as a forecaster is going to change going forward. Uh, we know that the models are getting better and better. 
Uh, but there's always that, you know, how is it going to affect uh, the people, you know, yeah. the public, uh, the the impacts? What what am I going to feel? What what you know, um, is it going to affect the morning rush hour, or the snow or is it going to be the evening commute? Uh, you know, things like that. So, you know, the impact, um, not just personally, but also economically and all the other ripple effects from there, how these uh, systems are going to affect uh uh, the public. Yeah. Well, w- one of the things I, I know that, that we were, Matt and I were talking about earlier were the old farmers almanacs. And I think they're still around, but mm-hmm. just kind of curious were those, and, and those were being published before we had modern computers and everything. So what went into those and how accurate were they? And are they, are they just kind of a throwback now that people do for nostalgia or? Cause they seem like people lived and died by it. Yeah. And it felt like it was a f- pretty accurate. I mean, I remember growing up and, you know, in the eighties and farmers almanac was what they talked about all the time. And sure. you know what, well, we're, we're scheduled to have a, a hard fall or a hard winter or whatever the mm-hmm. case may be a wet spring or, you know, a drought year or whatever. Well, that's that's a good question, and I, and I know there's the different almanacs. There's the old farmers almanac, the original kind of the, the traditional one, and then there's the farmers almanac. There are other almanacs out there. Um, I actually, and I won't give the name, but I actually know one of the persons who works on the forecast for the old farmers almanac. Mm-hmm. Uh, personally, I know him, and they actually he has his forecast finalized. Like it, usually, the farmers almanac is uh, it's released in like late summer. It's, August, September, around in there for that upcoming year. Okay. Um, and he has to have his pretty much everything finalized by like April. Oh my. Um, and I know some of the things that he does, and I think even going way back, uh, what some people it, going back in you know the early 1900s and maybe 1800s, however long uh, uh, the almanac's been around, um, what they would do is they would they would use analog years. Uh, they would say, okay, in this year there were you know, there were 10 tropical storms and hurricanes. Um, it was a, it was a cold spring, early spring. And then it got really warm in, in May and June. It was a very wet summer. It's, you know, so they look for patterns and similarities of certain years that matched up. You're never going to get an exact match ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they get, they get those analog years and then they, they say, okay, well, what is the closest match? Huh. You know, uh, going into 2018, 2019 winter, what's the closest match? Is it 94, 95? Is it 02, 03? Mm-hmm. You know, and so they wait. Now we have a lot more technology today that we could put that on spreadsheets and so forth and look at all the global patterns. Sure. That, um, terms that you guys, I'm sure, have at least heard of, like El Nino, La mm-hmm. Nina, um, you know, and, and some of these teleconnections around the globe. And so we try to find the best, they try to find the best match. And then they go from there. They say, okay, well, in 1994, it was this in December. So they go similar, you know, in in, in 95. So that's kind of how the, you know, more or less the recipe behind that, um, uh, you know, what's involved in that. But obviously it's way, way long range and it's very generic. And sometimes it might have the... They might have the right idea pretty close, and other times it, it could be way off. Well, I know my great-grandpa Ritter lived and died by it. He was mm. a farmer, and I always remember Mark and Dad talking about great, great-grandpa great Ritter would always talk about the Farmer's Almanac, sure. and we're supposed to have this type of year or whatever the case may be. And, I mean, they, there was a lot of people that, you know, because you didn't – obviously you didn't have – the weather forecast and right. that, that, that's what they, that was their weather forecast, you know, and mm-hmm. to figure out how to plant it. It just shows you how far we've come oh, yeah, and, and, and what farmers now can do. And, and even by farmers, I'm talking about deer hunters that are maybe part-time farmers yeah. that are putting in food plots. And, you know, like this summer we had a huge drought mm. and it, like here in the Midwest, it was some of the worst drought conditions we've had in a long time. And then this fall or, late summer early fall we're having flooding everywhere it's like mother nature's on menopause or something i don't know what's going on it's all over the board she's hot she's cold what's <laughs> what's the deal here yeah and you and you were saying about how you guys had drought out there we couldn't shut off the rain i mean we couldn't shut the spigot off here in in the northeast this this summer it's we're working on i think we have here in state college pennsylvania i think we have to get like seven inches or six and a half inches for between now and the end of the year to have our all time record wettest year. Wow. Um, And it's just crazy. I mean, I've never seen a summer 
so wet here, just persistently wet, wet, wet. Uh, the ground water has come, uh, it came up so far that you had standing water and fields and that that never went away. It had to evaporate from above because it couldn't sink down into the ground. The, the groundwater was so high. So it was like, you know, think about this principle. There's, there's the same amount of water around the globe all the time. It never changes. It's just how you distribute it. That's why when things are out of whack, with the patterns, that's why some place gets drought and another place gets floods. Well, there's but you about, always have the same amount of water circulating around the globe all the time. It never changes. I got about eight feet of somebody else's water on top it. of my farm <laughs> right now. Literally, I got a farm on the Mississippi River we just bought that is about eight feet underwater. So it's uh, it was bad timing. <laughs> You've got your allocation and then some. Yeah, and it's, it's just crazy to think about how – you know, the ebb and flow of, of the weather pattern. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you try to manipulate mother nature the best you can and say, all right, we're going to time our food plots on this weather front coming through. We rush, 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 get them all in. Yeah. You might get a timely rain a couple of weeks. You need, you know, you need the sun to help, help them grow. And then we got too much rain after that. Yeah. They're it's all just hard to find it's, the right balance. It's uh, I, I would hate to be uh, a full-time farmer. I wouldn't make it. I'd yeah, be stressed out to them. On yeah. It. Your, your actual livelihood mm -hmm. depends on it. That stressed me out to no end. <laughs> Dave, you know, as, as I, I, uh, I was gonna say, that's a good point about being a farmer. I mean, I, I have a garden. I do it hobby. I love, you know, getting in the dirt and, you know, actually being able to eat stuff from my garden. I have, a, it's not a huge garden, but I, take pride in it you know with what i could get out of it but when something goes wrong whether you know whether a rabbit uh, crawls under your fence and 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 pretty much wipes out your you know your 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 lettuce and your um you know your beets or whatever or you get you get some kind of a blight or you know there's just so many things that can happen or it's dry dry and you, and you didn't get a chance you're out of town you didn't get a chance to water your cucumbers and then they dried up and you, they, you lost your cucumber crop and all that things that could happen and it's like, you know, it's OK. Life goes on. I lost, you know, whatever out of my garden and life goes on. But imagine being a farmer and that's your livelihood. So really, mm -hmm. you, you get to appreciate that, you know, yeah. what they go through. Yeah. So uh, so near one of my deer stands right now, there are a couple of persimmon trees that have ripe persimmons. And they're kind of a treat for me. I usually swing by and pick up a couple and and eat them on my way to the stand. Uh, but there, there's a, the old saying about being able to forecast what kind of winter you're going to be having by the shape of the persimmon seeds. And I'm wondering, is, is there anything to that? And or are there other signs in nature that you can use to kind of give yourself a general idea of what you're going to have a hard winter? Or is it going to be relatively warm? Well, I mean, I certainly there's got to be something to that. Uh, how much, uh, as far as from a seasonal standpoint, that's, that's hard to say, mm -hmm. you know, like they say, yeah, look at how how bushy the uh, the tails are on the squirrels, uh, you know, or, never heard or that. how many nuts they're they're storing up this year, or whatever. And it could just be because it was a big nut crop, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, I know, of course, going back as a kid, you know, the whole woolly bear thing, you know, that 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 uh, if you looked at a woolly bear, the ones that are brown, brown and and black, the caterpillars. If one, if you saw one that it was like it was it was uh, black on one end and brown in the middle and. It's like okay, well that's that's going to be a hard start to the winter and mild in the mi in the middle. And, wow, and that's detailed. detailed. Yeah, <laughs> that's a future cast. Let me go consult my larva, and I'll be right back and give you your long range forecast. Or if you found one, if you happen to find one that you know, when I was a kid, I found one that was like all black. It's like yeah, it's good winter, a lot of snow. <laughs> so, but no I, I think there are, certainly it. from uh, seasonally, I don't know what the verdict is. You know, only. Only the man up above knows that he's mm -hmm. he's the creator of everything, and he knows how how animals work and everything, and yeah. how how that work. However, I do know in a, in a short term thing, and you guys as hunters, you know this, that it just seems like when a storm is coming, um, you know, it it seems like animals are in more of a feeding mode, uh, and maybe more aggressively sure. and more uh, earlier than than they would normally. If a storm is coming, you're going to see deer maybe getting out in the fields a little earlier, and they're going to be you know, eating more. And of course, if it's really stormy, they're going to be bedded down. They're not going to be moving some. So, I mean, there, there are things that you could kind of get, get signals on in the short term in the next day or two, um, you know, from, from uh, nature. Mm -hmm. Are there many uh, studies out there regarding just kind of what say the moon, you know, that 
for whitetail hunters and i think even you know fishermen or whatever the case may be that that the moon mm -hmm. plays a big part people that it, work in the emergency room <laughs> yeah yeah if it's a full moon it's a busy it's night in the er yeah. it's it, it seems like that does has some effect on you know what the earth's population is doing is are there studies or is that something that in 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 your world you guys actually think about and give credence to you know i i i've I've noticed uh, in certain, you know, stages in that, you know, whether it's the rut, whether it's, um, you know, timing of different things in nature, even fishing tables. And you look at that, a lot of a lot of it is uh, goes and flows in with uh, uh, the lunar uh, cycles. And there certainly has got to be some it, it, I mean, you figure that the the, uh, the moon affects tides. I mean, there, that's a that's a established fact. We know that that it has an effect on tides generally tides in the ocean and bays and so forth they they're uh they're at their highest they tend to be higher than than they normally would be or other times right around a full moon or a new moon uh that's just a part of the cycle and so so the moon certainly does have effects on different aspects of of life and and nature um on the earth uh, and it and it certainly would have to have some uh effect on on white-tailed deer or whatever the uh, wildlife, you know, we're out hunting. Uh, I'm not, that's kind of out, outside of my, my expertise. Um, but I, 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 I've noticed on certain days and, you know, whether I'm going into my stand and in, in rifle season, or whatever, and maybe I'm going in in the dark and it's all, it's a full moon or right after the full moon. Um, it, it seems like sometimes maybe it's just my imagination, but I, I think I see more deer on those days than I do you know, when it's when I'm walking in, and it's dark and it's another cycle sure. of the moon. But uh, again, how much effect that has, that's that's a really good question. I don't know if we really have the answer. I know you did have a and I wanted to follow up with something, Tim, that you had sent me about the the waxing, you oh, know, yeah, the, yeah. Wa the waxing. waxing just simply means it's increasing, it's growing. And I actually looked at that. I actually looked at the like a, a Webster's definition and it's pretty, you know, it's actually pretty basic. It's uh, wax is to increase in extent, quantity, intensity, or power. Um, another definition, um, it actually meant to fill in the crevices. So when you think about it, what is, you know, a waxing moon? It's, it's, it's increasing in size and the crevices of the moon are being filled in. So that term is long. I mean, it's been around for, for ages, but waxing is increasing. Waning is a decreasing moon. Dave did research before the show. <laughs> He's the that's, first that's one. That's great. <laughs> Let's mark this down. Did <laughs> well, my homework. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, Dave, what do you think that this winter holds for us? Kind of in general, a lot of our whitetail hunters in the Midwest, but we have listeners all over the country that whitetail hunt. What it, can you can you give us? Kind of a snapshot of what we're looking for winter 2018. Yeah, that's um, you know, because I I know some years our long range crew. They're very confident. There was a few years ago, I believe it was 2015, 2016, when there was a strong El Nino. Mm -hmm. um, in my, like, let's say in the last 40 some years, I can remember three years that were strong El Nino uh, winters. One was 73, 72, 73, then there was 82, 83, uh, there was 97, 98, and then, and then there was this past one in 2015, 2016. Usually in those cases, where the El Nino is, is, is quite strong. Um, typically, um, you know, the signal is so strong and that's overwhelms everything. And the forecast in that winter was actually pretty confident, especially in the East and the Southeast. We knew it was going to be a stormy pattern. There'd be a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, precipitation. Typically it tends to be milder than normal, mm -hmm. uh, in this, in the Midwest and, and East and good, actually good part of the country, except for the, again, in the Southeast actually is below normal this year. Um, the signals, whether it's El Nino, we're probably going to have somewhat of an El Nino, but there's some debate. Is it going to be just a weak El Nino or, a, or a, maybe a moderate? It's not going to be a strong El Nino. Okay. So that signal is kind of, it's there, but it, how, what kind of effect? And, and then there's other global patterns that we're looking at and none of them are like really screaming out there and shouting that that's going to be the dominant one. Hmm. And I don't know if we're really going to have a good handle on which direction the winter is going here, maybe not until Thanksgiving or so. Okay. And it, it, we might, it might show its hand more. I would say at this juncture, I would plan on a lot of back and forth um, mm -hmm. battles going on. And when it's all said and done, when you tally it all up, it 
might actually end up being pretty close to to normal uh, in a lot of places in the in the eastern half of the country. Do you feel like the seasons have shifted at all? This is from a, somebody that lives and breathes it every day, a professional. Mm -hmm. I, you hear this a lot. You know, of course, <clears throat> you hear a lot about global warming, but mm -hmm. more lately I've heard a lot of people saying, man, it just feels like the seasons are start, have shifted somewhat. Mm -hmm. sure. and winter starts a little bit later, falls a little bit later, you know, spring starts later, just this, that cycle. Do you feel like there's any credence to that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I would say in a, in, a, in a simple answer, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I can't, you know, how much you could quantify that, I'm not sure. But just from my personal standpoint, I mean, I'm, I'm here in central Pennsylvania, and I'm looking outside, and yeah, there is a little bit of color, but it's like it looks so green. It's like, it's like is it really the 26th of <laughs> you October? forget what time of year it is. It's yeah. like almost looks like the 26th of September or maybe, you know, October 2nd or something here. And some of that has to do with all the wetness and the warmth we had earlier. But, you know, look at this this year. Um, it took forever for winter to end. It's like, is it ever going to end? Is it, it was just mm -hmm. chilly forever in March and, and, and into April. And then, and then finally it did like you flipped the switch and you were like almost into June instantly. Um, and then, of course, this year in September and into the early part of October, it's like it, it was endless summer. We had we had more warm, humid weather. It's like, is it this is <laughs> August, isn't it? No, it's October yeah. or whatever. So, um, and I know from his personal standpoint, I used to keep log of, uh, when I would see my first Robin No, oh. and it used yeah. to be, it was almost like clockwork where I lived in central Pen Pennsylvania here. I would see my first Robin almost always. It would be the second week of March. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my average date was like the 10th or 11th of March. And all of a sudden, like in the last 10 years, that's shifted way earlier, and I'm seeing my my first robins usually in late February. So take it for what it's worth, but that's hmm. that's the, that's where the rubber heats the, meets the road. That's that's real stuff going on that I'm observing. So I'm I'm not tracking there because I would assume they would if we were feeling like the winter is pushing later that you'd see them that you'd see the robin for the first time later, like later in March. So why earlier do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's, that's a good question. And you know what it could be? Uh, it, and, and there are some robins that'll winter over, not many, a lot of them, you know, in this part of the country, they do, um, they'll travel South, but there are some that winter over. And so it might just be that they were sort of hunkered down in, in, in a little area and, and they're, they start to kind of branch out a little bit and, and we're seeing some of those wintering over, uh, Robins, perhaps. That's pretty. That's pretty interesting, and that's cool that you kept not just weather logs, but but kind of nature logs Robin as watch. well. Yeah, I like that. That's neat. Yeah, it, it's rare to find people who are as in tune with natural cycles as hunters and anglers, uh, but and farmers really. And farmers, yeah, and, and and I don't know why I didn't think about folks that were into meteorology. <laughs> it's like obviously they're the most yeah, in they're, tune. They're, they're very much in tune with natural cycles. Yeah, no doubt. And and like I said, it's um I mean, that's something that's been a passion of mine and and certainly um you know, when I'm out hunting and you got some quiet times going on and you're you're you, it's 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 real quiet and and I'm you're not seeing anything then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always looking at the sky. I mean, always mm, you ask sure. my wife and we're driving down the road, it's like, get your eyes back on the road. And I'm looking at a, you know, a thunderstorm cloud <laughs> out, you know, drive. it's a cumulus. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's my passion. I can't, you know, not look up at the sky and look at weather and, and so forth. And now I've actually, I've actually graduated. And I have a, I have a smartphone. I have a, I had a Whoa. dumb phone up until about a year ago and now I have a smartphone. So I'll be on my stand checking radar this year. <laughs> well, it's interesting because <laughs> you know for a weather person you're you're constantly looking around at, at what's happening with weather conditions as a deer person you're constantly looking around trying to think i wonder if you know in that little wood you know wood lot right there what if, if there's something bedded down yeah. or like that's it's just doesn't Never matter ends. what your passion is that's what you think about all day mm -hmm. every day and one last question before we go here i wanted to know what exactly causes a change in pressure because we, we like I, I mentioned it earlier we put so much emphasis on barometric pressure and, and deer mm -hmm. movement what's the kind of the professional reason why pressure changes up and down and, and what causes it i mean probably the simplest answer is uh it's a it's differences in heating um as you as one place 
gets hotter or warmer than another, you create boundaries, you create fronts. Um, and as anybody has ever been in a cold room, maybe you had the heat turned off and the rest of the house is warm. And as you, as you, if you open up that door, what happens to that cold air? It always rushes out toward the warm air. It's not the opposite. The cold air always, you know, it, it, you go from, from high pressure to low pressure. And so cold, colder air is higher pressure. It's more dense. And, 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 and just the opposite, uh, when you heat the air, it's lighter. And so the pressures are lower. And so it's just a, a difference in heating. Uh, sometimes if you ever get a, it, it, we've done, we've, I've even seen experiments done where you have a, a controlled environment and you, you heat this, this room on one side and you keep it cold on the other and you increase that temperature difference. And what happens? You'll actually develop a wind, but you're developing the wind happened because of the difference in temperature, mm. which resulted in the difference in pressure. So and I have a question on that part specifically, though. Like in the late season, you'll get this last year. I don't remember, and I, I've not paid attention to it my whole life like I have the last few years. But mm. this last late season around New Year's, we were having pressure, I don't remember, like 30.5, 30, really 30 yeah. points. It was crazy how high it was. But the temperatures were like below, you know, well below zero. So – in that instance, I, I don't understand how the cold, extremely cold temperatures on top of already cold temperatures made the pressure rise. Well, look at it this way. What's what's pressure? Pressure is uh, basically it's like you're it's kind of in a way it's it's the weight of the air. And so isn't cold air more dense? The colder it is, the more dense it mm -hmm. is. And so, you know, the higher the pressure is, you got more weight. Uh, of the atmosphere and so that's that's why the pressure is higher but generally yeah if you have if you if you see if you didn't even look at your temperature your thermometer and you looked at your bar barometer and you see that it's like like you said 30.5 or 30.6 whatever ridiculous you know that that's got to be a very chilly or more likely a very cold arctic air mass hmm. uh, and that high pressure system probably originated up over the yukon or the northwest territories or something gotcha uh, so I know, Matt, you said one last question. One, I, one I last. One, one, <laughs> yes. And it has to do, you mentioned getting a smartphone. What is the, is there a, a delay? And if so, what is it between the results I see on my Doppler radar on my phone versus real time in the world? Yeah. That, and that's a, that's an excellent question. And I really think it depends on, on what app mm -hmm. uh, you have on your phone to get radar. Uh, I know AccuWeather's app is 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 pretty uh, fast. It's maybe within two or three minutes on average. I think that the answer to that is on the low end, it could be 90 seconds to maybe two minutes, okay. um, real time. Uh, on on the on the upper end, I doubt that it's more unless something really is wrong. There should never be more than like an eight or ten minute lag. Okay. That's really extreme on the upper end. I think the average. Uh, for most apps out there, is probably somewhere between like three and four minutes, three and three to five minutes, something like that. So, so there is somewhat of a lag. You say, "Oh yeah, this thunderstorm is going to be here, you know, really soon." It's like, well, it's, here now. <laughs> it's starting to rain already. You know that that's you, you're off by at least a minute or two or okay. three or whatever. So, you know, and being out hunting, that's like the absolute worst thing you want to ever do: lightning and thunder, and you're on a metal stand or something. Mm -hmm. That's like a huge no-no. You got to get out of here, just get covered. Don't ever be, you know, have your, yourself in that kind of situation. Um, I've been up in my stand one time when it was starting to ice. I was on top of a ridge mm -hmm. where my stand is, and there was some freezing rain and freezing drizzle starting. And boy, I'll tell you, at the end of the day, when I was climbing out of my stand, that was extremely, man, I had to be so careful getting, because it was all ice. Yeah. It, it had glazed up, and that's, that's another huge, I mean, I could have just been not, you know, oblivious to it, mm. but that, that was another, you know, um, hazard out there that was, that was pretty serious. Well, Dave, can we make you the, uh, resident meteorologist of Drury out here? We'll just have you on call whenever we need this. Has hey, been if really I gave awesome. Mark and Terry his number, they would light you up and be asking you so many questions. Mark yeah, specifically. I, I, my my phone would be blown up. I'd get text message from you guys, and, and here comes the buck of a, a of a lifetime heading mm -hmm. my way, and my phone's going off. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, if, if folks are wondering just how 
why Dave has been so great on this show. It's because Dave kind of does his own show. You want to tell the folks about your podcast? Right. Yeah. I was going to uh, just uh, give you a little bit of information about that. And we have podcasts. We have daily uh, podcasts. We have uh, ones we do on a, on a weekly basis. But, um, you know, our AccuWeather podcast, it's like kind of like the stories behind the weather. We've done topics like weather in the movies, uh, what's real, what's not, um, you know, how did weather play a role in historical events cool. uh, like uh, elections, big, you know, presidential elections and things like that. Uh, we bring in experts from across the weather community. Uh, we have storm chasers. Um, uh, Reed Timmer is, is, is our big storm chaser that, you know, does a lot of stories for us. Um, you could find the show on our website. If you just go accuweather.com mm -hmm. slash podcast, uh, you'll find those. And like I said, there was a lot of them archived on there. Uh, we have uh, other pla uh, podcast uh, platforms like iTunes, uh, Google Podcast, uh, Stitcher. Mm -hmm. uh, just search AccuWeather Podcast and, and a lot of stuff will come up. We have uh, new episodes every Thursday, uh, according to uh, Andy and, and Ken here. And uh, we definitely look forward to having you guys on in, in a few weeks. We look forward to joining you guys and, and probably giving your listeners a much different outlook on, on weather as how it pertains to the, the, the Midwestern hunter. <laughs> yeah, that was, it was great. Uh, like I said, this is, you ask anybody that knows me and I could talk about the weather. I mean, you could keep me on for three hours and I'll keep going, but <laughs> I guess there's back. something we yeah, got to cut it, but I love talking <laughs> about the weather guys. And yeah, hunting too. We appreciate you coming on with us and, and, uh, it's been a real delight, real interesting topic too. Absolutely. Yeah. So Dave Dombeck, senior expert meteorologist with AccuWeather, go check out his podcast. We'll link all that stuff up in the show notes so folks can find him. If folks want to find this show, the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild podcast, they can do that in all the same places, iTunes, Google Play Store, Podbean, Stitcher, all those kind of great uh, podcasting apps. And if you want to leave a question for us, just like Scott did, just go to the, the Drury Outdoors website, go to the podcast page, click the send voicemail tab on the right-hand side of your screen, leave us a message, and we may answer it on the air. And as always, if you're watching this podcast, you're on our 100% Wild uh, podcast page on YouTube, on Drury Outdoors. There's tons of cool stuff that we're putting up every week. Mm -hmm. We have a new bragging board from our deer cast Those users awesome. yeah we have new episodes of jury and winchester's natural barn going up every monday uh, of course the podcast hit subscribe we're working our way to a hundred thousand we've got a cool giveaway we're giving away a psc bow and you're automatically entered in to win it if you uh, subscribe and you can always catch us on social media at jury outdoors and of course the big play for us and we're here in the season is the app deer cast we have over two hundred thousand uh, uh accounts and growing every day as of today 215 at the time this airs probably 230 240 by then counting. 250 we're not counting it's crazy how <laughs> it's growing but i think it plays into you know we utilize weather there and 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 how it interacts with hunting and it just plays into how big of a need it is for the whitetail hunter out there to really mm -hmm. understand it a little better and right. how it affects your movement uh going into your hunt so check it out at uh both the the google play store and the apple app store and it's a free uh download for this year it's deercast and and uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed. So yeah. far, it's been it's been pretty pretty good. You know, one thing we have not told people is that they can watch this show within DeerCast. Mm -hmm. All of our episodes are loaded in there, so just like it's it's literally in your pocket. Absolutely. So until next time, I think uh, it's a good place to cut her off. We appreciate you guys joining us for another 100% Wild podcast. And uh, if you're out there, safe hunting. See you guys. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV is brought to you by Lacrosse Footwear.